This mangrove creek is vitally important to all the coastal fish and to the fishing industry. It's a nursery area where the young marine life can grow up in safety until they're big enough to go out to the open sea. But it's believed that this same peaceful creek also spawns a monster, a creature so deadly that it's feared even more than the shark in Australia's tropical north. It claims more victims too. Next month, in the month of December, these box jellyfish swim out of the creek and along the beaches. They grow quickly into lethal adults that plague our swimming beaches here. Their sting is so powerful, so great is the shock from the intense pain that the victim sometimes collapse and die within minutes. We in the North suffer such a killer, and yet we know so little about the deadliest creature on Earth. Australia's tropical waters have always presented a certain number of hazards to the bathers. The shark has been lord of the sea, the creature most feared, the efficient killing machine. The shark is responsible for 131 deaths throughout Australia. The deadly sea snake has killed only a few, yet its venom is perhaps 10 times more potent than the cobra. Nature's ugliest villain, the stonefish, may not kill a wading bather, but the pain is unbearable. The exquisite beauty of the cone shell belies its danger. The extending proboscis can inject a lethal dose of venom into a victim. Electric blue markings signify an angry blue ringed octopus. Two people have died from picking up this attractive little creature. Early fatalities from marine stingers in northern Queensland were first attributed to this Portuguese man of war. But scientist Dr. Flecker questioned why victims died only north of Mackay and not in southern waters. He began a thorough search for the mystery killer. In 1955, the enemy was at last identified. Kiranex fleckyri, the box jellyfish. Seventy people have died from this jellyfish in northern Australia. More than double the victims taken by sharks in the same region. The creature was popularly called a sea wasp, and only recently has this misnomer been changed. For some bathing tourists have been seen looking skyward instead for the creature to fly in and bite. Beneath these benign waters lurks an invisible invader, a creature now known to be the most venomous on Earth. Even a minor sting, a slight touch of the tentacles brings agonizing pain. Oh, it's hurting. Oh, oh, ah, oh, oh. Dr. Bob Hartwick of Townsville's James Cook University has spent the past four years on a full-time investigation of the little-known behavior of the box jellyfish. He's applied a drop of methylated spirits to a tentacle and studies the dramatic discharge of the venomous nematocysts. There are millions of these poisonous pods, each with a coiled harpoon ready to fire and inject the poison into a victim. Not all victims die, but the terrible whip-like lesions from the tentacles leave ugly scars. 
Anne Richards was eight months pregnant on that hot March day of 1979 when she sat in the shallows at Rose Bay in Townsville. And what happened that day when you were stung by the box jellyfish? I believe it was in Townsville. That's right. I just decided to go for a little paddle. I'd only been in the water a few minutes and I was stung. I realised straight away what it was. That the, it was dreadful. I, I just ran out of the water up onto the beach and collapsed. Was it that painful that you, oh. it made you pass out, do you think? Or? Well, I think so. It was dreadful. It's, you just, I just want to tear my hair out. I just want to do anything to get rid of that pain. It's three years now since that terrible day when she stopped breathing and her face and limbs went black. Genevieve was born soon after the trauma. She loves the water, but Anne's painful memories hold her back. Roll your belly. No, roll over. Swing your arms. Kick your legs. Stinger signs warn Townsville bathers because of so many attacks. 13-year-old Kim Keeling thought the stinger season was over on May 21st, 1980, when she went for a swim at Paloranda Beach. Is this where it happened? Yeah, it happened out there, uh -huh. about five metres. And, well, tell me, how, what happened? Well, I was wading out, just the family was in the water, and I was just wading out, and then I felt this sudden shock in my leg, and I thought a shark had got me. And you thought it was a shark? The, the shock was that bad? Yes, and I lift yeah. my leg out, and but I saw these purple tentacles and that, of course, I panicked then and the pain, it was so, oh, you know, it felt like bees mm -hmm. stinging all at once in the same area. Mum, she raced up to the shop and she just grabbed some bottles of vinegar mm -hmm. and I came back and she poured them all over me and vinegar really stings because they were open wounds. I s you see that the scars are still visible there. Yeah. You're still going to have them for quite a few years. Mm. Do you still go back in the water now? Uh, no, I'm a bit squeamish, but mm -hmm. I might go into my ankles or my knees, but that's, that's all. all. Scars may fade away, but Kim's fear of the water sadly may never leave her. The eye can track the snared fish, but the box jellyfish is invisible to bathers. They appear along the beaches from December to April. People thought they were blown in from the north, for the danger is greatest when the wind shifts to a nor'east and the seas are calm. Bob Hartwick discounts that theory. He's sure they must be local residents, born and bred in the estuaries close by the beaches they swim out to. Stinger-free pools are a community effort to keep cool in the summer. This one at Port Douglas soon silted up. With its bad stinger record, Palaranda Beach was wise to have a pool, but when the tide goes out, there's no water. Many beaches have to be closed in the hot summer days. The popular ones are dragged with a net every weekend to check if the stingers are in. Protective pantyhose is the in thing when the lifesavers at Ellis Beach dress for their first drag of the day. The Life Saving Association has instructed all its members in the first aid treatment for box jellyfish and even to inject the newly developed antivenine. Only three minutes may elapse from a severe sting to agonizing death. Frenzied twitchings precede the sudden collapse. It's like a massive cardiac arrest. Resuscitation is the immediate treatment with vinegar poured on the clinging tentacles to inhibit any further discharge of the venom. There's more than a dozen juvenile box jellyfish in the first hall. That's the official end of swimming at Ellis Beach for this day.
Tourist promotions have tried to ignore the Stinger problem. Ben Krupp feels that public awareness is vitally important. It's wrong to attract tourists to the north and hide any dangers. There's always a way around a problem. The Ellis Beach nippers are not going to have their Christmas outing spoilt. They all wear pantyhose. The summer danger in the surf has resulted in the locals appreciating the scenic freshwater pools. It's now the end of April, the end of the stinger season, and the Port Douglas locals celebrate a return to the water. If Dr. Hartwick's theory is correct, the adult box jellyfish have left the beaches and returned to the estuaries to mate and breed, and then die. Ben Kropp accompanies Bob Hartwick and assistant Alan Webb on an August field trip up Alligator Creek south of Townsville. They're in search of the sedentary polyp stage of the box jellyfish larvae. find on these? Huh? Well, what we're looking for is the polyp stages of the animal. They've mm -hmm. never been found in nature, uh, but we feel they must be somewhere up here in this river because we have found the next stage along in the life cycle, the little swimming stages. So the task now is to find that larval stage that comes just mm -hmm. before. Can you see them visually, if, if they exist on that rock? I could conceivably, except that there's such a forest of stuff on here, all this algae and bryozoans and tube worms and barnacles, that I uh, wouldn't trust myself to try and mm -hmm. spot them uh, on here. We'll take these back to the lab and look at them under the microscope, so there's uh -huh. no chance of us missing any. Dr. Hartwick has cultured larvae specimens in his laboratory, and he studies an amazing metamorphosis in the polyp stage. This is the earliest recognizable larval stage of, of the box jelly. It's called a creeping polyp. Uh, it's a little worm-shaped creature that crawls over the bottom looking for a place to settle down. A single stinging cell is capable of instantly killing a prey animal. The polyp then opens up its elastic mouth and stomach to engulf and digest its prey. Polyps are able to reproduce themselves asexually by budding off additional creeping polyps, which crawl away and become attached somewhere else. After months of feeding and budding, this polyp has begun its metamorphosis, the complete transformation of its body into a swimming stage that we call the medusa. After about 10 days, this little carnax has almost completed its metamorphosis. It is now a true jellyfish medusa, struggling to break loose from the bottom and to swim away. Eventually, the little box jellyfish breaks free, and after two weeks of fasting, its eyes and mouth and tentacles are all actively engaged in the search for food. The team returned to Alligator Creek in September in the hope of confirming the presence of the advanced Medusa stage.
things swimming around. Can you see any Medusa? I, I see fish. something in there, yes. A small fish, uh, crustaceans, but uh, I see a few various kinds of jellyfish. Whether or not they're the kind we're after, we'll only be able to tell when we get back to the lab with the microscope. This discovery is an important breakthrough in Dr. Hartwick's research. He's now established that the box jellyfish young do indeed grow up in the nursery areas of the mangrove creeks. A minute monster slowly takes shape, destined to feed and grow and ultimately become a threat to man. The nursery world of the mangrove swamp has other violent creatures, coming up next on The Deadliest Creature on Earth. Port Douglas is a popular tourist and fishing resort in the far north. It's also Ben Crop's home, for he lives in this historic shed over the water where he operates his shipwreck museum. This idyllic base at the mouth of the estuary is where Ben and his wife Lynn carry out their photographic research on the box jellyfish. Pelican! Here he comes. Gonna throw him some fish? Some fish? The creature now is hidden away in its minute form in the upper reaches of the inlet and will not appear until its December migration to the sea. But its neighbours in the mangrove swamp are equally interesting and some of their life cycles have a remarkable similarity. To understand the behaviour of the box jellyfish, Ben and Lynn must also look to this place where its life began. A flash of colour, the giant claw of a male fiddler crab, signals the presence of this remarkable inhabitant of the mud banks. The ritualized fight between two males over the possession of a female never injures anything more than the opponent's pride. Just before the rising tide reaches him, the fiddler cuts out a neat disc of mud and flips it snugly into place over his burrow retreat. The fish that walks on land, the primeval mud skipper. The unsupported body of Synapta a sea slug with a snake-like appearance collapses out of the water. Browsing tentacles keep on funneling the food through the water-filled tube. The lagoon shallows almost hide a small spanner crab. The naturalists on Captain Cook's endeavour first discovered the epaulette shark in these northern waters. Lynn knows the colourful shark is totally harmless. The mangrove trees that breathe through their roots in the drowning tides also harbour a rich community of marine life. For the mangrove's single most important role is as a nursery. It provides essential food and shelter in the juvenile stage of the life cycle of almost every coastal sea creature.
in these eerie waters, clouded with seething life, Ben finds that many other species of stinging jellyfish also live here. Cassiopeia andromeda is a rare jellyfish, adapting its behavior to the shallows of the inner swamp floor. Flipping upside down allows the food-bearing water currents to flow over the feeding arms. Tamoya is another box jellyfish with four heavy whip tentacles and a very powerful sting. The tentacles... Jellyfish swarming from this estuary, coming up next on the deadliest creature on earth. It's now December and the monsoonal storms are building up. The wet season is close. It's the month of cyclic activity for the many juvenile creatures spawned up the mangrove creek. Ben and Lynn are running over swarms of young jelly blubbers. They're growing fast into adult size, and within the next week, they'll move to the mouth of the estuary to spawn on a spring tide. This ensures the larvae returns well upstream. The jelly blubber migration is a good time clock for the phantom appearance of the box jellyfish. In this Port Douglas inlet, Ben stumbles across a remarkable spawning behavior never documented before in Australia. Thousands of worms are swimming out of a side creek into the inlet. A closer inspection reveals the worms have no head or mouth. They're actually a spawn sac released by the adult up the creek. The wriggling creatures are designed to have a very short life. Their disintegration releases both eggs and sperm to fertilize in the sea. A precise phase of the moon once a year triggers this phenomenon. Ben can calculate to see it again a year later, three days before the full moon. Two days after Christmas, a tropical low deluges the North Queensland coast. The wet has begun. While Ben shelters from the storm, he knows that the flood rains will trigger a crucial change in the life cycle of the creatures he's studying. The deluge is a powerful signal to those creatures still poised in the creeks awaiting their time to leave. Along with the barramundi, the prawns, and other nursery fishes, the juvenile box jellyfish are flushed out to sea. The stingers are now heading round the point at the mouth of the estuary. Their destination is Four Mile Beach. Several swimmers are unaware of the multitude of invisible killers invading the beach area.
We tend to think of jellyfish as primitive creatures, but box jellyfish are highly developed animals. They can manufacture the most powerful of all poisons, maneuver around objects, and dive under waves. They are never washed up on beaches like other jellyfish and only approach the shallows when it's calm. The beasts are grouping at the south end of the beach and feeding on the abundant bait fish. Ben and another photographer, Hubert Hoffer, follow up local reports on recent sightings. This should do here, Hubert. Yeah. This is where the fishermen got them yesterday. Yeah, did, did they get many? Oh, only about three, but it's worth a try. Mm -hmm. You want a glove? Yeah. Many of the stingers here are the second deadly species of box jellyfish, called Chiropsalmus quadrigatus. Only an expert can tell the difference. In comparison, the body and tentacles do not grow quite as large as flecky rye. Hey, you over here, look. Look at them all. Gambling with their lives, some tourists still chance a swim. Ben has just netted 80 box jellyfish in a 200 meter length of this beach. Every morning, Ben walks the beach shallows and counts the growing population. It's amazing, really, just how many box jellyfish are out here. Far, far more than I ever imagined. Now, I just did a walk along here, about 400 metres of Four Mile Beach, and I counted 110 box jellyfish. Now, they're, they're not large, they're only what we call juveniles. They couldn't kill anyone, but they could certainly give a nasty sting. But normally, when you walk along the beach here, you're lucky to see 10% of the real population. Meaning if I dragged a net here, I would get at least 10 times more. Now that means a thousand box jellyfish just out in this little area. And that's quite frightening. Four Mile Beach is host to a larger predator, causing havoc among the stinger population. For seven days, the manta ray sweeps the beach, feeding on schools of shrimp seen leaping upward to escape the vacuum-like mouth. Ben suffers a painful sting, coming up next on the deadliest creature on Earth. Bob, there seems a lot of controversy about using metho and vinegar. What was the reason for the changeover? Well, Ben, it was basically because of uh, some experiments that I did with some medical colleagues uh, in which we found that methylated spirits, to our surprise, uh, made the stinging cells fire, whereas vinegar, as we ultimately found, uh, inactivated them, which is what we much preferred to, to be going on to a sting victim. Well, I always thought that metho would have to be the best, so uh, anyway, next time I'll try the vinegar. Ben is handling stingers every day in his film work, and he'd like to be positive for his own safety that vinegar is better. There's only one way to really be sure. I just, he's withdrawn really? the tentacles a bit, yeah, just lay it against me, against there, and snip it off. 
Well, lay the tentacle on there. <laughs> Go on, get that with. Snip, snip it. Oh. I think you got okay. four there. Oh, I got quite a few. Don't, don't put too much. <laughs> this one's big enough to kill a child, but um, move this one back up a little bit. It's falling off. This one's big enough to kill a child, but it, it uh, not an adult. Right, we've got to wait a minute. Is it stingy? Oh, Jesus. Yeah. A full minute. Yeah. Oh, I can't see my watch. Can you keep yeah. track? Yeah, I've got it. Reason for a minute is that, you know, anyone stung isn't isn't going to uh, uh, get to methyl vinegar before then. Vinegar yeah. on this one? Well, check my pulse first. I want to see whether it's got to be up. Yes, it's up. It's up about 20. Okay, what, is it a minute? Yeah, it's over now. Okay. Vinegar? No, uh, methyl first. Methyl on this one. Hold your Just hold it straight on. Do, do, do more. Oh, it's, uh, it's right. Just hold it, hold the thing on. I can, I can feel I got hit again. And, uh, you know, that, that uh, Bob's right. The, I got hit again. So it makes them fire more. Yeah, it looks like it. Okay. Okay. Vinegar. Pull a bit more. I'm gonna get rid of this pain. You asked for it. Well, <laughs> it's still hurting, but there's no, you know, I couldn't feel any any uh, any more hits. So, a bit more. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's just hurting. This one's hurting like mad. Oh boy, I, I can feel the difference. That's hurting, but this one's really hurting. Yeah, well, vinegar's the answer. It, it doesn't stop the pain, it just stops more pain, that's all. Oh, they'll have a lot on today. Oh. Lubs too, hoods. Make sure there's no gaps. Yeah. Here's the boots. goes for total protection. He has no desire for another agonizing sting. The swarms of box jellyfish are growing to lethal adult size and Ben wishes to observe their natural behavior. We saw that many of the jellyfish swam to Four Mile Beach, but some still remain in the estuary and others turn north along the mangrove shore. The water is calm and clear on the high tide. A prawn is caught. The tentacles draw the victim into the bell and maneuver it through a narrow tube leading into the stomach. This gastric cavity lies at the inner top of the bell and will digest the prawn within two hours. The purple anemone of the mangroves grows to a large size. Its paralyzing tentacles sting and engulf the unwary fish. When two powerful stingers make accidental contact, they both fire back but neither appear to suffer any damage. It's difficult to explain this behavior. Two have snared the same fish. It's a tug of war which ends up in a tangle of tentacles.
the eerie waters of the mangrove swarm with life, a food chain from plankton to pilchard to predator. Danger lurks nearby. is tracking a huge box jellyfish. It measures perhaps 24 centimeters across the bell. That's about as large as they grow. The lethal creature leaves the estuary on the ebbing tide and navigates a sinister path towards the beach area. Eighty-four-year-old Doug Henderson has spent 20 years researching the box jellyfish problem. He's discovered that an aluminium sulfate solution, now marketed under the name Stingos, will render the marine sting of venom harmless. Hubert has reluctantly agreed to be the human guinea pig for Doug's tests. There's one. All right, bring him in. I got him. Is it enough for the test? Yes, big enough for the three inches All right. All right. Oh, it's not a really big one, but it'll do for the experiment. Oh, it'll do for my test. Yeah, it's about three inches. So right. You want to take it like this? Yeah. All right. You got him. Uh-huh. Oh. <laughs> Brace yourself. Here it comes. Oh. All right, that'll do. That's enough. That stings. The stinging? Yeah. Oh, you'll notice relief yeah. straight away. Yeah. In the recent official test, the uh, volunteer felt relief right away, and uh, although it was a very severe sting, Ooh. in 10 minutes, the pain had completely gone. Didn't expect it to be that intense. <laughs> oh, they're, they're savage, all right. Aborigines always used the leaf of the spider lily to treat a victim. Others found some relief from onion juice or meat tenderizer. Doug is testing his latest development, an inhibiting cream applied before a swim. No, no sting. No, actually. I can feel it here where there was no cream. Oh, yes. But where the cream is, the, I can't feel right a thing. Right now. Simulated swimming action. Now give her another test. Yeah, see, see how that one works. Any stinging? Uh, no, not, a, not on the area where we have got uh, cream. Where the cream just, is? just out here a little bit. But the, oh, well, yeah. there's no cream there. Yeah. No, can't feel a thing. When the southeast winds blow and the seas are rough, the box jellyfish simply disappear. Ben feels they probably swim seaward and hug the bottom in deeper water, but no one truly knows. Bob Hartwick is experimenting with a new tracking device, a directional hydrophone linked with a high-frequency transmitter, which will be harnessed to the first adult jellyfish he can locate along Wonga Beach. On the lookout with Bob is Dr. Jack Barnes, the foremost authority on the box jellyfish, with over 20 years of pioneering research. Yeah. 
I think he's moved in towards shore, Jack. I've got him now on a line off in that direction. Right. Probably 20, 30 feet in front of you. I wouldn't expect him to go in shore, but I guess that microphone knows. The device works. Bob hopes soon to unravel the mysteries of the creature's movements, where they go when the seas are rough, and where they travel to, to mate and breed. In Ben's two years with the box jellyfish to make this film, he's become aware of a vital missing link in their life cycle. Ben is seeing hundreds of juveniles, but only a few seem to reach adult size. The juveniles must suffer a heavy predation, but who is that predator? Many large fish live in the estuary, and Ben begins a watchful search for a likely predator. It must be a local fish, or perhaps this hawksbill turtle enjoying the mangrove root. Ben has seen these turtles eat other jellyfish out on the reef. The stonefish has an extendable jaw to swiftly engulf a victim passing overhead. It's not interested. There's no hesitation with two southern butterfish. They eagerly nip the tentacles from the bell. Ben is amazed. He hadn't even considered the insignificant butterfish in his list of likely predators. There must be more. The hawksbill turtle is true to Ben's expectations. It obviously relishes young box jellyfish. Ben realizes he's on the threshold of a major discovery. With the cooperation of Cairns Reef World, he conducts exhaustive tests to establish the real predators. The round-faced batfish is added to his growing list. The most common large fish in the estuary is the spine foot. Its leathery skin is as tough as its appetite. We have a fourth predator. The four predators also frequent the beach areas, and Ben wonders whether they're capable of attacking a formidable adult jellyfish. This surprise discovery may provide a solution to the box jellyfish problem, for predation does hold the key to their population control. But we, unwittingly, and perhaps with grave consequences, often destroy all four of those predators. Scientist Bob Hardwick has made some breakthroughs in the life cycle of the box jellyfish in unraveling some of its mysteries. And Ben Crop's many underwater observations have revealed its behavior in natural surroundings. Still many gaps in its known life cycle, and those mysteries of this silent killer really must be solved. Fear of the box jellyfish tarnishes the golden attractions of this far north tropical coast. If and when the key factors which control the creature's migration and its numbers can be solved, then it will be possible to predict just when this deadliest of all killers will appear on our northern beaches.